So, Pastor, thank you so much for having this uh, interview, sitting with me to have this interview. Um, uh, you know, I've been I've gotten to know you for over, over a year now, and yes, um, and I have gone on this journey, my own personal journey. But you you play a huge part in that uh, in that journey, and I've gotten to know uh, behind the scenes, obviously. Uh, like most people, I saw you on YouTube and then eventually reached out, made myself known and and then eventually just gotten to know you and just and now I want to share to the world, you know, this you know kind of things that I have learned about you and want them to also know those things about you as well. So I appreciate you taking time to do this. I know you are a busy man, a busy uh a busy pastor. One of the things I wanted to ask you is just uh just to get to know for people to get to know you is just your childhood. What was life like before straightway, before uh, the Holy Spirit, like, what was life like growing up in the Dow house? You know, you, I, I've met your, I've got, I've got to meet Daddy Dow. I got to meet your mom, li- little short lady, little, little bit lady. How was it like growing up? Where'd you grow up, and how was it like growing up in the Dow home? Well, to make it fast, um, we grew up. I grew up in the projects okay. here in the inner city, here in Nashville, um, J.C. Napier Court. So the people that are familiar with the big city of Nashville, they'll know. Um, along when I was probably about, I don't know, getting ready to be in elementary age or something like that. My mom and dad had moved out of it, and um, we dad bought a house, moved in a house. You know, they're stepping up. Um, I went to elementary there, also in Nashville. Um, we started moving further and further out to the suburbs, or what used to be called the suburbs. Now it's just nothing more than inner city because of the expansion. Um, and, and up until that point, uh, the majority of schooling that I had was mostly just all, um, you know, black children. You know, the whole school is probably like maybe 98 percent, you know, black or people had melanated skin. Um, when I got about fifth or sixth grade, my mother and father moved way out in is uh, outside the city and the school dynamic flipped. Um, we went to I went to a, an elementary school. Uh, middle school and high school, and I ended up being the minority. It was like two percent black to ninety eight percent white. So, so even when I went to graduated high school, um, it was probably like no more maybe twenty uh, black people in the whole entire school. Um, so there's a big flip in the dynamic. So that um, that's why I, that's that's how I grew up. That's my schooling. Mm-hmm. So when you when you were growing up during that whole time schooling, and that's a, a interesting that so you grew up mostly with black, and then all of a sudden flipped the other way where mm-hmm. you was part of the majority. Now you're the the minority. What was the um, was you with you guys big in the church, or did you have a religious? Uh, was you guys big in religion when you were growing up? No, sir, not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, the only thing I can remember anything about the Bible um, was my mother. You know, little Mama Dow sitting at the table, and she would read the Bible. Um, what happened was, is when I got about twelve years old, um, I just had it come into my heart to want to go to church. And mind you, again, uh, the church I went to was a white Baptist church. I was mad pretty much. I was the only black child or the black person in the whole entire church. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had it in my heart. There was a little bus that would come around. They would send a bus to come around and. Um, I asked if people wanted to participate, wanted to go to church. And it was a, a, a little small church by the name of Temple Baptist Church in Old Hickory, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I went there for a few years. Um, and, and that's the extent, pretty much, uh, of my church upbringing. Mm-hmm. So I learned a little bit, you know, there, here and there, as much as you can at 12, 13, 14 years old, if you know what I mean. So when you were, uh, so, okay, that's good to know. So when you were growing up, what type of child were you? Like, were you the, were you the kid that uh, went around bullying people? Were you the kid that, uh, I mean, like what time, you know, or were you, were you bullied? I mean, how, how would you describe your, in that regards, would be, you know, you went from an all black school where you were probably the majority, then you went to all white school, were you picked on or were you the, the one that was doing the picking on, you know, like how, how would you describe the, uh, your dynamic as a child there? Actually, I was very passive, uh, very passive as, as a little child. I was very passive, um, quiet all the way up to um, maybe like eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And then like some flip switch, you know what I mean? Like what in the world I'm doing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I became a little bit more lively, a little bit more active, uh, a little bit more vocal mm-hmm. uh, by the time I got ninth, 10th. And I was very vocal by 11th, 12th grade. Um, 
Uh, I was nominated in high school for, you know, quite a few of those things like most wittiest, most school spirit, you know what I mean, stuff like that. Um, they're in um, our yearbook, you know what I mean, uh, in there. But um, I um, actually, I was never really bullied. I was never bullied. You know, you've always had people that would uh, be older and want to pick on folks like this. But I actually, believe it or not, I was the type of person that would go around and if, if someone that I saw um, wasn't strong or, or didn't bother anyone and I saw someone bullying them, that's where the majority of all my childhood fights come from, from me protecting what I call the weak. Mm. And so I would fight anything from that point. If I was in ninth grade and I had to fight a senior or something like that in order to get them to, to leave a person alone, mm. uh, that's what I would do. I would do. And I remember you saying it. And so as, you, as, you, as we continue going into before you get to uh, – get out of high school now i think did you meet uh, your your wife uh, sister, uh, carol. sister carol did you meet her during that time or was it after high school no it was during high school as a matter of fact i was in a summer work program it's called cedar a summer work program and um uh, you know the way they um you, you have a job i worked at the public library um downtown nashville and um, apparently either this 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 lady was either her cousin or a friend she only lived right down the street and um, one day we was in there, we was, I was working in, in trash for offices and stuff like that, and about 15 or 16, I mean, uh, don't quote me on the age. Um, and I asked to actually see her, her um, a purse or wallet if she had any pictures. And I started, she let me see it. So I started flipping through them, and I stopped at Carol, and I said, who is this? She said, well, that's my cousin. She, I said, where does she live? She said, well, she lives on... Um, North 6th Street, I said, really? I said, I used to live on North 7th Street. Mm. I said, I know exactly where she is. And I said, um, let me have a number. A number, and, and uh, within a week or a few days, I actually um, called her up and told her I'd come over and see her, and I drove over there to see her. Mm. So when you went there, I mean, did she know what you were going there to meet her for? Or I don't know if she knew what I was coming there to meet her for. I didn't even know what I was going there to meet her for. <laughs> I mean, I... I I went there and um, knocked on the door, and, and of course, at that time, you know, Carol at the time, she was 5'9". Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting old, we're older now, mm -hmm. and she was about two, three inches taller than me. Okay. That was a late bloomer, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And um, knocked on the door, sitting and had a conversation, um, and then um, after that, I left, and then we've been together ever since. Ever since. Wow, you've been married for over 30-some years, right? Yeah, and well, I think um, anywhere between 33 and 35 years, something like that. She'll be, she know the numbers better than I have. But um, you know, we got married when she was 18. She's 51 now. Okay. She's 50, I'm 52, so you can do the numbers okay. from there. Okay. But we have actually been together. If you go by um, the dynamic of you know secular society, mm -hmm. I would say probably about 33 years, Something like that, but we've been together like 36, 37 years. Did you, did you, did, uh, did she, she, she didn't grow up with her dad, right? Did she grow no. up with, okay. Her dad was in the military, but her father and mother divorced, divorced when she was at a very young age, maybe like 12, something like that. You didn't have to go through like dad to, to, to be able to, to get, you know, to date her or to. No. To get her so. No, she had an older brother that was very protective of her. You know what I mean? Um, and of course, you know, we, we was fine. Okay. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, of course, to me, it didn't make no difference because that's the type of person I was, if it was fine or not. You know what I mean? It, 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 she said, yeah, and I said, yeah, I was on a date. You know what I mean? So, so now, did you play any sports now? I mean, did you play, did you play were you an athlete? Or, I mean, what, what did you do in, for um, extracurricular uh, activity uh, in school? I played football, um, um, baseball, basketball, track. You know, stuff like that. Um, it, but it's, I was very unusual because if I played the game, it, it, let's, let's just take the high school dynamic. Now, if I played the game and, and, and I saw that, okay, I, I'm pretty much not going to, you know, make it to the next level or the collegiate level or something like that, then I would just quit and go to work. Mm. So I went to work, also did a little bit of boxing, okay. uh, a little bit of golden gloves there. Um, and, and, of course, a lot of, Street fighting at home, <laughs> you know, what I mean? around the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Um, been in a few of those, been in a few of those at school. And again, uh, it's it's really funny and ironic because every fight that I've ever been in, I can actually really truly say I never started it. I really truly never started. Um, 
I went out um, for high school basketball um, twice and got cut twice. Mm. And the reason why I got cut is because the coach at this white school, Madison High School, he said, we don't play that kind of basketball around here. And that kind of basketball was the Dr. J, Michael Jordan type thing where, you know, black folks being kind of acrobatic in the basketball, whatever way you can get the ball in. And, of course, a lot of mouth. You know what I mean? A lot of mouth. And, um, and, and so I didn't – and I was mad at first, but I didn't take it personal. But my dad went up and had a few words with him. You know? <laughs> Daddy died. Yeah, dad died. I had a few words with him. But it's, it's all right. So, okay, so then you – now you, you're getting to the point where you're done – we're getting done with high school. Mm -hmm. And um, so what, what What were you going to do? Like, what was, what, what, did you have any plans? Did you go to college? What, 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 was, what was life like going, uh, leaving high school and going into the next phase of life? Well, I didn't really truly know what I was going to do. So what I did um, is I went to anywhere from three to six months, I went to a, a school called ITT Technical Institute. I was studying engineering. Um, and and I, I quickly got bored with it. You know, it was just still nothing there. Um, and then one day I actually... Um, um, got a call from one of Carol's friends mm -hmm. and um, he wanted me to actually pick him up and take him to the MEP station uh, where, you know, where the Army is. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, no big deal. I'll take you to MEP station. I took him out and I was sitting in the, the room and the recruiter was looking at him. He was kind of a little big and obese mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, fit and trim. Mm -hmm. And so they immediately start turning attention on me, and of course I'm blowing them off, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I ain't gonna hurt to take a test. I said, no, nah, I ain't gonna hurt to take a test. So I took a test and did pretty good on the test. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, they, you know, they started their little spiel. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I mean, what, what, what do you got? This, I want to do something besides just if I was gonna go in, I would do something that's gonna be adventure. Something that's kind of like my nature. Mm -hmm. And um, they showed me this um, old '50s film of people jumping out of airplanes. Mm. And I said, oh, that looks good, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, so from that point on, uh, they chased me around, chased my mother and father around. Uh, if I went to the gym, they were there. Wow. Because uh, for about four or five months, man, I just like, man, y'all just leave me alone. I wasn't thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And then dad now looked at me, boy, you ought to get out there and go get in that arm and do something with yourself. Mm. And I thought, did you go in the army? You know what I mean? <laughs> you understand? I mean, you going to tell me something like this? <laughs> you know? And so anyway, um, I did end up signing up and, and I went into the military in, um, in 1985. 1985. So, so, and, and, and I, it's always good to hear your war, you know, you, you going into the army and, and just how you, um, just the different, you know, there's different sections in the army, you mm -hmm. know. So how did you get to the uh, the 82nd? 82nd Airborne, Airborne Division. How did you get to that division? And, I mean, when you were in the army, did you already know you were going to do that based off of your recruiting? Or was that something that you figured that you wanted to do once you got into the army? Well, I went in totally blind and oblivious. I didn't know what was what from what, you know what I mean? And um, But um, after being in there and in, in boot camp in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, um, they w uh, we realized that we were some type of uh, experimental package platoon in, in boot camp. And what they were doing, they was, they was trying to see how many people were actually going to uh, make it from boot camp, AIT, jump school to the 82nd. Mm. And we, we had, I, I, I can look at my picture, I'm going to just estimate, it's probably like maybe 70, maybe 60, 70, mm -hmm. maybe that much mm -hmm. Um but only 20 of us made it to the 82nd Airborne Division. You know, many so when you say uh, boot camp to AT, what's ATI? AIT is uh, your schooling. Okay. Your, your schooling. You know, what? Uh, there, there was going to be what the uh, Army calls your MOS. Okay. You know, some people, when they go in the military, it's 11 Bravo. That means they're infantry. Okay. Uh, at the time, it's 31 Kilo, 31 Uniform. Okay. It changed over 31 Uniform, which is communication signal. Okay. Um, and so... Um, we ended, I ended up in uh, 82nd, 82nd after passing jump school at Fort Benning okay. uh, in 85. And um, I spent five and a half years in the 82nd Airborne Division. How hard was it to get into the 82nd uh, Airborne? Well, jump school is, it, it's, it's, it's physical. It, it really is. It's physical. And, that, and uh, I've saw people um, on the first jump, you know, they, they will go through all that hell in the first week. Um, and then mainly learn how to do parachute landing falls and, and, and uh, mock up doors, you know, jumping out of planes and stuff like that and, and the tower and stuff. I saw people go through all of that because it's a three-week school. Mm -hmm. And then get there and do one jump 
and I saw people just quit left and right. Um, now, don't get me wrong. In the military, when you do something like um, airborne school, air assault school, uh, ranger school, um, um, SEAL, let's just say for the Navy or Force Recon for the Marines, um, when you do anything like that, um, believe it or not, the Army actually tries to make you quit. Mm. They want to make you quit. And so they make uh, things very stressful, mm -hmm. very extremely stressful for you on the mind. There's a lot of hollering, a lot of screaming. I often say that if um, the people out here in the world knew the way that they were trained human beings, uh, don't, don't even talk to me about a dynamic of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how that the military and this training is acceptable in the world. Mm -hmm. But anytime you correct someone out here mildly compared to that, um, it's, it's not acceptable. Yeah. You follow me? So um, uh, by, if you made it to the 82nd, uh, if you made today's second, you had something different in you. Mm. Um, and so that was pretty much the extent as far, how, as far as how I got to the 82nd Airborne Division. And what was your ranking? What was the highest ranking that you got into the Staff Sergeant or E6? E6, E6. E6. So, so now you, you've been in the military. So how, how, how many years did you serve our nation? Ten years. Ten years. Ten, ten years. So, um, and most people in, in that situation, I mean, usually, I mean, what's the, what's the average that, that people usually serve in the... Uh, 20 years. 20 years. Okay. They have a 20 year. You can um, serve 20 years uh, as an, you know, up to an E6. You know, I was moving pretty long. I was moving fast in rank, what considered, all things considered. Most people will retire mm -hmm. at 20 years, some 21, 22. Uh, you can go all the way up to 30 years as an E9. Mm -hmm. So you, so now you've been serving, you, you served our, our nation for 10 years. Did you have, did, was, did God play a part during those times that you were in the Army where religion was a big, you know, religion or the Bible, was that, a, did that play a big part during that time? Or No, sir, I wouldn't, um, I mean, I always had um, a healthy dose of fear uh, of God. So in my own religious order, you know, people would say a lot of GD and I wouldn't say it, you know what I mean? But I would say everything else, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I've always had um, a, a fear of the Most High. Um, I didn't... Um, really have any any play, you know, as far as going to church or nothing like that. Now, after, of course, I'm married with Carol, and we, we have children now, you know what I mean? Uh, she would almost, you know, like drag me to church on Easter and something like that, you know what I mean? Other than that, I wouldn't go because I was too busy being a heathen. Mm -hmm. So did you, did, where would you say you got that, that, that fear, of, uh, the fear of God um, was you, was your relationship, how was your relationship with your dad? Did you have a fear, uh, you know, a natural fear of him? I mean, was he a, a disciplinary? I mean, I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to figure out where did you get that? Because, I mean, going to, not going to church, not really growing up in the church, mm -hmm. where did that fear come from? It's, um, it, it, it really truly is based on the individual person. Um, and um, I, I really truly believe that the, um, the most high uh, is the one who actually does the picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying... Um, that people, everybody doesn't have an opportunity because they do. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually knocks on everybody's door. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just I just paid attention to the call when he did call. When I was 12, I paid attention. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of drift away when I got in the military. I really just drifted away because, you, know, you know, uh, the military and, and really religion, like people would say, it don't mix really good, mm -hmm. if you understand what I mean. But... Isn't the, isn't the army? Isn't the army usually talk about God and you know God bless America? I mean, sure. Like they always say you have your Bible, you have your Bible, and you have your military. Did they did they have that in the military? Yeah, well, just like hypocrites do, just like America does, just like everybody has a they acknowledge. Uh, God, they acknowledge him, but he's really, truly not in their heart. You know, people have religion, uh, but they don't really, truly, you know, follow him. And, you know, it, it's all about their life. You know, I tell people all the time that when you went in the military, there's, there's a, a few dynamics they're going to remove from you in order to uh, accomplish the mission. Uh, people are inherently born, all of us are born self-centered, self-focused, self-absorbed and when you get finished with it all just flat out selfish mm -hmm. and you can't really be selfish in the military you can have pride but you can't be selfish mm -hmm. um and 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 in this life right here 
the way humans live, it's it's really all about them. Your your time in the in the military. Now, did you did you did you go to any? Uh, were you a part of any wars or or any type of uh, battle where you had to do hand to hand combat? Um, uh, I spent the first five and a half year, years in the 82nd Airborne Division. I went quite a few places um, because I was attached to um, Second 325, uh, which is an Airborne Infantry Unit. Um, and I would say conflicts. You know, what I mean. Um, the world has a, a, a misunderstanding of, of what war is and what conflict is. I mean, we really, truly um, tell the truth about the whole thing. We, the nation hadn't been at war in quite some time because war is supposed to be declared by Congress. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now they're calling it a war on terrorists, which is there's a nameless, faceless entity that we're fighting, if you understand what I mean. And that thing can go on for decades, if you understand what I mean. Congress has never declared war on um, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, uh, none, none of these places that we're in right now. Um, um, to make it simple that people can understand if through the news media, the general populace, if they know about it, that's what they call war. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at movies out there like Unit, mm -hmm. um, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of them out there. You got these elite little small groups. Um, nobody knows when they go, when they come back home. Mm -hmm. If they die, nobody knows. You understand? Mm -hmm. it is, um, that's the difference between war and conflict. We have people out right now mm -hmm. that CNN and Fox News don't know about. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and uh, these are the elite of the elite uh, that are taking care of conflicts mm -hmm. throughout the world. Um, America, if um, you see the reporting of all these bombs being dropped all over uh, Iraq, you understand what I mean? With Saddam Hussein, they call that war. Uh, if they allegedly Saddam Hussein, uh, not Saddam, Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden. Uh, was that done by a special unit? Yeah, it was done by a special unit, but I, I'm, I'm pessimistic because I'm outside of the military now, so um, I don't have the wool pull over my eyes. Mm -hmm. I was in the 3rd Infantry Division um, over in Germany mm -hmm. uh, for about two and a half, three years. Um, and then uh, I came back and I ended up in, a, in another special unit, which was um, um, Op 4. Op 4 is a Joint Readiness Training Center, or JRTC. Um, it, it's a very powerful uh, training unit. Okay. Uh, and, and that unit, um, what, what we did in that unit is, is basically train the elite and the infantry, the high-end infantry, to actually to be able to go out to these conflicts or these wars. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, uh, so going from war, or in your case, conflicts, because it really wasn't a declared war by Congress, did you, where did you live most? Did you live in the United States during the time in the military, or did you, I mean, I, 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 I was talking to uh, your, your wife, uh, Mother Carol, it sounded like you lived in Germany and, and other parts of the world. Is that I did. We lived in Germany for about three years. Okay, three years. Okay. Three years. And of course, you know, while over there, whenever we had some downtime, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would travel, go to different. I've been to Paris or France. Mm -hmm. I've been to France. Um, uh, I've been I've been to quite a few places over there because, it, it, you know, it's, it's all like traveling the states over mm -hmm. here. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty close. But they're countries instead exactly. of instead of states or whatever like that. So. So, yeah, I mean, when you lived in Germany, did um, did you have children at that time or did they? Yes. We had a uh, matter of fact, we had um, Chuck, my oldest okay. son and, and Lydia. OK. OK. So do you guys have do you go to school in Germany or do they have school just for the military children? I mean, how, I mean what's life like when you live in uh, abroad? In serving the, serving our country in the military, I, just, I mean, I just want to. Not everybody knows what that looks like. Do you go to the German school or do you go to a school that they set up for the military children? The military is is um is is like like the Vatican almost. It 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 is its own individual nation basically, mm -hmm. while functioning inside of a nation. Mm -hmm. So they have on post. They have everything. Mm -hmm. They have everything. They have. Uh, gymnasiums, gyms. They have schools. Um, they they have yes. They have PX called the PX grocery stores. Uh, anything that that you need, it's it's there. Okay. It's there. So our children went to school on post, okay. on post because they were little then, very little. 
like daycare and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And how many people would live on these uh, in these? Uh, I guess military camp, is it base? What do you guys call yes. it? Okay. How many how many families would be there? So when you when the men were off, I'm assuming the the wives or whoever, the vice versa. But uh, how many people would live on these bases? Oh, it's quite a bit because if you have, um, uh, let, let's say, if you have like a a company. A company could consist of anywhere between 100 to 150 people. Okay. And then within a company, um, you have like, I mean, within a, a battalion, you may have like four companies or three companies. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a battalion. Okay. You know, Alpha Company, Bravo Company, Charlie, you know, Delta, whatever. I'm trying to keep it simple for everybody out there. And then um, you'll have people have different missions on the base. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, you may have supply over here, field artillery over here, infantry over here, and then you have the detachments to these particular mm -hmm. units that would make up the company, but all of these people make up a division. Mm -hmm. And so in a division, you know, it, you could either have, uh, like the 82nd, keep it simple, at the time it was like 22,000 people. Wow. Okay. And so it's, it's, um, it's, it's a lot of families, a lot of families. Of course, in the military, there's a lot of children born, children, yeah. you know, because when soldiers go out and come back and stuff and uh, and it's inevitable children are going to be born mm -hmm. uh so they have a, and and of course i understand the dynamic because you know uh, military wives they get lonely a lot because i mean i was gone a lot mm -hmm. an extraordinary amount i would venture to say out of the 10 years i was in the military i would say six of those years i was probably out doing the army's will so i mean and, and i'm just curious you said they have everything i'm assuming they even have church and all of and it. So how about if you were a Muslim or a different, would they have those things or all of it, all of it there? Mm -hmm. so, so pretty much it's a community. You're living in a community within a nation. So you, you, you served the nation for 10 years. Uh, you, you have children. You, uh, you have uh, Chuck and Lydia. Lydia. Mm -hmm. Lydia. And um, so now when did you have that moment where you felt that you were called or at least uh, um, received the, uh, the, when you felt like God was calling you or tugging on you, where you felt like I want to go to church or when did that happen? I was um, probably at that time I was in the military, maybe six years, okay. maybe okay. something like okay. that, six, six years, okay. um, six, six and a half, something right there. Were you in the United States or in Germany at this time? I was in the United States. Okay. Actually, actually um, um, when I came back from Germany, we, um, I was stationed at Fort Chaffee, Ar Arkansas. That's where we actually did all the um, all the war playing, all the training okay. um, up up there, um, and then the whole entire whole entire JRTC Joint Readiness Training Center stuff. They, we moved to Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, shortly after being there, um, I had a supply sergeant uh, named Sergeant Langford. We was both in the same platoon, okay. same squad. Um, I had uh, he he um he said Sergeant Dow and just one day in passing he says Sergeant Dow have you received the Holy Ghost I said oh yeah I got the Holy Ghost I'm Baptist <laughs> you know I'm I'm just I'm just drinking cussing <laughs> you understand what I mean just basically a heathen just flat out heathen anyway along the, as the day went by something was going on in my heart something was going on wow. really going on and um. I saw him again later that day. He said, hey, you want to come to church with me um, Friday night? I said, sure. I didn't think nothing about it Friday night, you know, church. And I didn't think nothing about it. Um, so I actually went. So I was at home. I was getting dressed, getting ready. And, of course, Carol asked me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. You know, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> you, you're going to the club. You ain't going to no church. You understand yeah. what I mean? Uh, but for sure, I was going to church. So be, 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 I wanted to stop you I mean, and be, ask you this question. So when you say nothing was going on, he asked you the question, you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I mean, did you, were you looking? Was there any conflict that you were going through? I mean, that says, I mean, I, I mean feel empty or anything. You were just, just going about your day, and he asked you that question. But from that question, you start getting something stirring up in your heart. Yeah, it was something to stir in my heart. I wasn't looking for anything, you know what I mean? I, I just, I was pretty, you know, your, pretty, your right, yeah, yeah. pretty good ten. I at this time I was, I was gonna, I had my mind somewhat made up. I was just gonna go ahead and retire in the military. You know what I mean? It's not bad, you know. Yeah, yeah. After you know, twenty years, thirty-eight years old, yeah. you know, retire, you can go do something else. Um, so no, but um, my mind, you know, just from that, my mind, because I never heard nothing about receiving the Holy Ghost at the Baptist church or any other churches I went to. You know what I mean? Um, 
but there was something going on. There was something going on, so I answered the call, basically, and I went. Uh, I couldn't tell you what the choir was singing, couldn't tell you what the preacher was saying. It was just like, you know, it's like um, this this experience. You know, the world is still existing around you, but there's something going on in your mind. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, at the end of the, the service there, the, the bishop here, you know, in apostolic churches, this was a holiness commandment keeping Oh, apostolic yeah. church is very unique because I didn't know you never been to a church like that. No, I never knew nothing about no Shabbat, you know, mm-hmm. Sabbath or nothing like that. I didn't know nothing about that. But they kept the Sabbath. Again, to me, I was just going to church. church yeah. You know what I mean? And so um, I'm up there. He calls up the prayer line and stuff like this. And, and I just said, I need prayer. You know what I mean? Didn't know what. He looked at me and he says, you need to get over there and repent. So I went over there. To the altar, next thing you know, it's like a, a floodgate just opened up mm. out of nowhere, just like bam. I was crying, I was screaming, hollering, and uh, I was repenting of um, all my sins, everything I've ever done in life that I could think of that was a sin. Mm. I, I was, you know, I'm very loud. Mm. Um, um, I called them things out loud. Mm. I mean, really loud. There was something going on between me. I never had this experience before. Um, and, um, I received a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, I started speaking in tongues. Mm. Mind you, nobody told me that I was speaking in tongues. Nobody told me that this was the Holy Spirit and this is how you receive it. If you understand what I mean? Um, none of this was, it was just something going on between me and the father. Mm-hmm. Um, I got up after the experience. Um, everything was quiet and in, in the church, everybody was looking at me. The bishop walks up beside me. And he looks at the church and he says, this man right here has received the genuine Holy Ghost. You better watch him. Mm. And I get home that night about 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, wow. when people, that's normally what time people come in <laughs> from the club. <laughs> you know what I mean? I told Carol, I woke her up, I shook her, I said, I received the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. What? I got the Holy Ghost. Ah, you know what I mean? You know, yeah, leave me alone. You know, you get it. I had received the Holy Spirit. She watched me. She watched me very closely. Um, I went from, you know, doing a regular old routine if you have time off, like wash the car, get up and do the dynamic, watch TV and stuff. All that was gone. I did nothing but study the Bible. And the reason why I, I know what was going on, now I really see the picture clear what was going on. Um, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was upset. Mm. I, I was happy, but I was really upset. Mm. I was upset because uh, I went to church and nobody ever told me about this. Mm. Life changing experience. Mm. I started, I started reading the Bible and uh, found out we've been lying to. Uh, and so I started asking a lot of questions. Uh, none of these preachers, Baptist church, or nobody could give me the answers. And um, I come to find out that these people were involved in basically a business. A church is a business. They didn't really care about people. They didn't care about their soul. Um, after receiving the Holy Spirit, uh, it was to me it was kind of like you realize how serious it is, it's his. And so I started really um, diving into the book and started stu- studying subjects and everything to find out what is going on to get this right. Um, I realized that. If I would have died on, on a mission or on a jump or I repelled out of the helicopter, uh, oh, I would have been buried with honors, had flag draped over the coffin, wife, you know what I mean, all this other stuff. But I would have went to hell. Mm. Literally went straight to a burning hell. And, um, and, and so I started studying. And in this study, I discovered that Christianity, all these religions, are lying. They got the same book that we have. We were, they were lying. They didn't like me asking questions. I'd ask questions. <clears throat> At the apostolic church, they had some of the answers. You know, I, I came into the knowledge of the Sabbath there. 
um, eating clean foods, you know, not eating pork and stuff. And then after I left there and got out of the military, came back home, I was still even more deeper in studying. Um, and I continue to keep discovering more lies. You know, church is really a business out there for these people. Uh, these pastors, they don't really truly care about um I'm going to use the word soul because everybody's used to that word. Um, but they don't really truly care. And But I did. I did. And so I had this, this drive in me that on my watch, whoever listens to me, they're going to know the truth. So, I mean, it's just kind of just like you, you know, remind me when you was a child, you know, when you said when people with the weak, you just had this sense of you wanted to protect those who were weak who couldn't protect themselves. But it's kind of the same I guess I, I see the same correlation when it came to the souls. You wanted people to know the truth. Yes. And, you know, because you've been lied to, and you didn't want anybody else to be lied to and everything like that. So when you got that moment where you, uh, how did you, now you're still in the military, you know, you said you got in year six. Mm -hmm. How were you able to still practice the, the Sabbath and still be in the military? Did you, did the, 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 the military allow you to, to practice keeping the Shabbat? Well, they had no choice mm -hmm. um, because at this point, I was, again, I was different than everybody else. You know, in the Army, the Army comes first, mm -hmm. you know, in the mission. Um, at this time, after I received the Holy Spirit, God, y'all come first. Mm -hmm. He come first. And um, they was telling me, I went through all the stuff. I was willing to lose all the stripes, get kicked out, do whatever you want to. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to, I was not going to disobey what I knew to be true. Mm -hmm. And I read, so um, next thing you know, I'm standing on, the colonel's carpet, mm. lieutenant colonel's carpet. Um, and he has a chaplain, you know what I mean, sitting right there because um, by this time I'm having conflict with my platoon sergeant, conflict with the first sergeant, conflict with the captain in the company, just conflict everywhere. And I told him, I said, I'm not going to be breaking the Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to field, but it comes come Sabbath, Friday night at nightfall to Saturday night, I'm not doing nothing. I'm going to sit here and read his book. And, um, and of course, then, um, you know, the um, first sergeant and all them, you know, you're going to my, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll tell you what, let's, let's just go ahead and, and put it like this. You ain't got one man in the United States Army bad enough to make me break this Sabbath. Mm. That's not a one of them. Mm. And from that point, they knew I was at, how serious I was. So that's, that's how I ended up on the, cup, on the battalion commander's carpet mm. and um what he did they called me in and they had the chaplain there start asking me a series of questions and of course they didn't know what the book says but the chaplain knew what the book says mm. and the question was over sabbath and over these holidays and all this other stuff and and i would answer and, and the commander would look over at the chaplain the chaplain would drop his head and 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 say he's right you know what i mean and i kept going and then after a while after that went on for about an hour or something all this drilling you follow me um they actually said this man is not going to be compelled. I mean, we're not. We're going to leave him alone, basically. Um, you know, what I mean, Let, he's going to follow his religion. That's how they put it. Um, and so, I didn't have to work any Sabbaths. Mm. I wasn't going to do it anyway. Oh, yeah. You follow me? So, what was the biggest? You know, like you know, I'm, I'm thinking about myself and so many people I've interviewed and talked to. They have all experienced some type of form of persecution. Mm -hmm. Would you say this was the biggest one uh, dealing with the military, or were there other persecution that you experienced? You know, you know, coming into the truth, like you know, being t or being tested. Are you going to keep the commandment or not? Was this one of the biggest tests that you had to go through, you think, or was there others? Anybody who really, truly uh, follows the real Jesus, the real Jesus, anybody who really, truly follows the real Jesus, you're going to have persecution. It's going to come first in your family. It's going to come your workplace, your environment. That's how I know that this Jesus, this fictitious being that they have created, um, out here um, though that has the same name that we use, uh, Yahshua, Jesus, they're preaching and teaching another one because when you go and read the, the Gospels and you see all the persecution that he went through and what he said, he says that all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so I get the majority of the persecution from people who say, they know Jesus. Mm -hmm. So no, it, the, the persecution is real. Mm -hmm. um, 
I often tell people you get to find out who is submitted to Satan. Because, I mean, after all, if I'm teaching people to keep the commandments, be obedient to Yah. Um, how does all this hell proceed after it, if you understand what I mean? Something is wrong somewhere. So, like, did you have, who, who, how did your parents receive you or your siblings or your friends? Uh, you, you tell me about the military, but how did they receive when you came into this truth? Okay. Or even people at church, you know, I'm, I don't know if you're still part of the apostolic church that you were the Sabbath keeper. How did they receive it? Um, you know, I mean, the apostolic church I was in at the time because I'm, I'm just now learning and growing, you know what I mean? Um, I, I've always been, an, I would say, an independent thinker, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, an independent thinker. Uh, I was already proving things, even, you know, stuff I did. And um, the church was pretty much fine as long as I was there. But when I left, that's when the, the conflict and trouble even happened with them. Um, one of my, you know, my sister Carol and I, we'd come home, what the army calls leave, uh, the world calls vacation. Um, my dad, he would mock me. You know, he would tell me there's some bacon in there, boy, get in there, eat some bacon, boy, and stop all this nonsense and stuff like that. Carol's family didn't too much know what to think because they were religious. You know, Carol grew up in the church. She went to a Baptist church. Um, uh, I forget the name of the church right now, but in, in Nashville, big old church in Nashville. And so when I got home, I, uh, my dad would mock me. Uh, one day I told him, I said, you know what, old man? I said, you, you for sure, you're going to hell. Mm. And I walked out the door and left, went down to Carol's house. By the time I got down there, um, my dad had called. He was crying over the phone. Got back. Um and I went, I opened up the door. He was on the floor, on his knees, crying out to, to God. Mm-hmm. And um, I looked for a church around that we could go to, you know what I mean, to minister to. And uh, Dad died. He repented. He got filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. He got baptized in his church. And as soon as he came up out of the baptism, he ran through the whole entire church wet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Didn't care. Mm-hmm. My mom um, sometime later, about maybe a year later, she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I told him to, to go to this, this particular Pentecostal church until I get back home. Well, anyway, when I got back home, they were still going to Pentecostal church, you know what I mean? So I would just preach to myself, Carol, and my two children. Mm. Lydia would sing a song, Chuck would read a scripture, Carol would sing, and I would turn around um, the lazy boy, and that was pulpit, <laughs> and I put the Bible on, and I just preached to them. Wow, how we humble beginnings. So, so then, when did straightway? I mean, how did that uh, come into play? Then, so you served? Did you did you? You said people can serve twenty years. You only served ten years. How did you end your time with the uh, with the United States Army? Um, the way straightway came about. Well, I ended my time in the United States Army. Let us go there because you know it's, it's based on a contract. When my time was up, I didn't reenlist. Okay. All right, so I didn't reenlist, and so I was done. Mm-hmm. Cut severs, cut ties. This is where the conflict came in with the apostolic church. Um, because even before the, the concept of a community even come into my mind, I was reading um, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. It's, it's pretty simple. Everybody can read it. It's right there in, in black and white, as the old saying goes. Um, I started reading about that people had all things common. The early disciple, the early church. I started reading about people sold their possessions. And so I presented to the bishop, Bishop Mulberry. Um, he's passed on and gone on now. Um, and he said to me, he said, it ain't going to work. And I said, maybe it's not going to work because nobody has ever tried it. You know what I mean? Um, he says, you just want somebody to take care of you. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, I'm one of the biggest tide pairs in this church right now. I don't want nobody to take care of me. You understand what I mean? Um, so I left it at that. So when I got back home, um, I'm, um, paying off debt. I'm working, um, three jobs, two jobs. Then I finally got down to one job as, as I started to eliminate the debt that we had accumulated. Um, we was going, we had, we met a few other people. Brother Shane comes in, my mom, and dad comes in. Uh, we would have in church in a home, just like you would read about. Even in the letters of Paul, we would have church in a home. And then we ended up having church in a basement. And then we ended up moving all in together. You understand what I mean? Uh, and every family had its own room. And so this time I'm 
still heading towards this this uh, community thing. I don't really truly know what's going on, so I, I start um, getting on radios, you know what I mean, trying to look around, because at the time the internet wasn't that big, you know what I mean? I started looking around trying to find other people who was maybe doing something similar to this so I could get an ideal or dynamic. Um, and that's how straightway end up coming to be. Now, there's a, there's a you know, um, there's a guy named R.G. Stair, right? Mm -hmm. it, does he come into play during this time where you were looking to learn how to do community and stuff, or is that further down? I mean, no, he actually comes into play around about this time. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I went down and actually, he's in Walterboro, South Carolina. Okay. And I went down and met him. There was another brother named Brother Baker up in Kentucky, and there was another uh, pastor there in, in um, um, South Carolina as well. Um, I believe it's Jefferson. Um, Pastor Roberts, okay. you know, there's three different places, three different communities. So I had, you know, a good, a good, a good idea of what what it looked like. Mm -hmm. I went down there to meet the old man, um, very serious. And I'm going back at this time, very serious old man. I uh, had a lot of respect for him, uh, preaching straightforward. Um, you know, the old time hard, hard hitting holiness message didn't bother me none because, you know, in the military, we used to being hollering and screaming at. I did a lot of hollering and screaming. You know what I mean? I'd mostly just tune in and listen. Um, and um, very nice people, beautiful people on the community. Everybody meek, humble, quiet spirit. They got along just well. So uh, obviously, you know, RG still has this, uh, this uh, uh, negative thing. And obviously you've been you've been uh, associated as being one of, or at least been one of his protege or been discipled by him. And, and because of the negative stuff in here, it's kind of rubbed off on you. Can you explain mm -hmm. how you guys, you know, end up going your separate ways and how come there's this, uh, this negative aura that's on you that based off of what he did? Sure. I'm in, my job, I'm in Tennessee. Okay. He's in Walterboro, South Carolina. All right. Um, I don't know everything is going on. Neither does he know everything is going on up here. You understand what I mean? So uh, anyway, one day I got a call. I got a call um, because I was in fellowship with him. You know what I mean? I was in fellowship in, just like I'm in fellowship with you, just like I was in fellowship with Alpha Starley Church or nothing like, you know, it like that. I was in fellowship with him. And, um, and one day I got a call that he was asking, you know, all the pastors and elders if they would just come down to see him, you know, come down to the community. And so myself and Pastor Rice at the time, we jumped in our truck and drove all the way down there. And we was there for a day or two. And I'm like, well, where are we being called down there for? You understand what I mean? Well, why are we here? Because I got a community I'm working on at home. You understand what I mean? So anyway, we had this big old meeting and come to find out um, that there was um, um, a lot of promiscuity, a lot of, um, a lot of sexual misconduct going on. Um, and it, w it was greatly disappointing, you know what I mean? Um, um, the allegations that was levied and charged against him, which were true, is that he was messing with little girls and men, uh, women, and their wives owned that community. Um, so we had a big old meeting. Um, and and, and it, uh, what I'm telling you is the truth. We had a big old meeting. Um, I was the youngest, even in apostolic church, I was the youngest in, amongst the elders and pastors. And even in this, I'm, I'm, I'm the youngest because the, the people that ordained me, they was considerably older than I was, if you understand what I mean. Um, and where'd you get ordained? Did you get ordained? At the apostolic church, at the apostolic church under Bishop Mulberry. Okay. It's amazing how nobody ever associates me with Bishop Mulberry. You, you know what That's I mean? You, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, so anyway. But we had this big old meeting. There was this big old meeting. I'm sitting back watching, listening, seeing everything is going on. Come to find out that Pastor Roberts and another brother, David Jackson, they knew about this behavior uh, six months to a year prior and never discussed it with anyone. Of course, I mean, the Bible says, you know, about covering a multitude of sin. Um, I'm very disturbed because on the community, you get to see everybody. Everybody, every single day, you eat together every day. You live together. You follow me? I, I'm disturbed because I'm wondering how in the world that people can't see what's going on. Where is the discernment, if you understand what I mean? Um, so he admitted to everything that was going on, and, of course, some brothers was highly disturbed. And, and of course, all the people was really upset and stuff, and because they all wanted him to tell the people, tell the church, you know, tell the people. Um, but before the end... Um, I had my say, and my say was 
Uh, um, just what I stated before, I was upset that the people there, you know, you got to understand, there's 150 people, maybe 200 people living on this place. You got old men, young men, and you got all these, nobody knows, nobody's saying nothing. What is going on here? You follow me? And so um, I said what I had to say. Um, me and Pastor Roberts traded words. You understand what I mean? We traded words in there. And I told them all that nothing was going to happen to them. And the reason why nothing's going to happen to them is because they're going about it the wrong way. It's kind of like uh, Job and with his three friends, you know, Eliphaz, Elihu, and all them. And, um, and, I'm, and, and I saw this. And so when the meeting was over with and everything, um, I was heading out, walking out the door. And uh, uh, Brother Stair had said, where's Pastor Dowd at? Where's Pastor Dowd I was the only one he was concerned about. Where's Pastor Dowd at? And um, he said, don't leave me. I said, I am going home. I want to meditate on this for a while. But you'll have my answer. You understand what I mean? Um, again, I'm upset at the older men on the community that don't have any discernment, you know, to know that they're seeing in account. Because mm -hmm. uh, you've been, you're here straightway. You see how we do things. Um, I'm upset with Pastor Roberts and David Jackson. And I'm upset with all these guys because these guys knew and yet they did nothing about it. And you never hear their names. Uh, I'm, I'm eight hours, 500 plus miles away from them. And yet, um, anytime, you know, it, it's like if um, you go out and see, and I don't even know you, let's say Brother Kabir, you know, KGB, uh, big Green Bay Packer Hall of Fame guy. Um, you and I are friends and we, we're associated, but yet um, you um, rape these women, hypothetical situation. Uh, all of a sudden, because I'm your friend, we, we pitch us together and stuff, I'm guilty based on what you did. I don't understand that dynamic. You follow me? Uh, so guilt by association. Anyway, nevertheless, I understand the reason why I'm being taxed, Satan. You know, I get it. I get it. I, I, Satan. Um, so I go back home. I talked to the community. There was a few people on this community that actually um, was living on this community that came in through his ministry, uh, Brother Stair's ministry. I let them move here because they was close. Uh, they end up leaving the ministry. They left the ministry because of him. Because, again, you have to make up your mind. You're following man, you're following Yah. You understand what I mean? Um, the next thing you know, the advent of the Internet. People get out there, Tim Butler or some of these other people who um, were, I don't know, I, I still to this day, I'm appalled how that I'm somehow guilty by association when I didn't even have a dog in the race. I know the reason why, because out of all of these people, uh, I'm most, more effective in the ministry. You know, I'm more well-known. And and so these next thing you know, the lies start flying, everything else, and, and uh, that that's how we end up in this situation. So, I mean, I believe, you know, you've been accused of, um, you know, child abuse or... Yeah. Uh, um, all types of stuff because of this whole situation with stairs. So that's how that all evolved. So I even had the Department of Human Services and Child Services called on me over some stupid stuff. Um, and, and one of the allegations was, and this is how stupid the world is, is that I was sexually abusing my daughter in front of the pulpit. And they would investigate some idiotic stuff like that. Um, I had to actually get a lawyer. <laughs> I'm serious. I had to get an attorney. Um, and, of course, there was nothing to it. It was just all allegations. You follow me? Just because that man did that, that don't mean that I did it. You understand what I mean? Uh, I got some big shoulders. Do you have any, is, do you have any record? Do you have anything on your record that, that found you guilty for any uh, sexual abuse or spouse abuse or child abuse or anything on your record that you know of? If it's the record of life, yeah, I've had quite a few women. Um, there ain't no doubt about that. But far as the, in, in the ministry abusing anyone or anything, never. No, no. Uh, nothing at all. Nothing at all. I, I mean, um, you know, you, 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 whoever is professional out there, get the FBI, CIA, they can go. They know everything about us anyway. Go pull it all up. Nothing. No, I don't even have even a speeding yeah. ticket. And then, so you, 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 you're aware of people like, uh, you know, Jim Jones and, mm -hmm. And um, David Koresh, yes, he, these are all people that are cult, they were part of a cult, had communities or things of that nature. When you hear these names and you being associated with them, what do you, what, what, what does that do to you? What is that, how does that make you feel or what do you think about those? It doesn't disturb me at all because I'm, um, um, I'm pretty strong, strong in the mind. But a cult to me, 
uh, the root word to the word cult is culture. A cult to me is, is the largest religion in the world, which is Christianity. The people are blindly following something that they have no idea because they have not done their due diligence to study, mm -hmm. to find out what's going on. You have Christianity and Islam. Both of them are major cults mm -hmm. from based on my knowledge of what the word says. Jesus today would even be called a cult. Matter of fact, they would call him a crackpot, a fanatic, a kook, mm -hmm. uh, the greatest cult leader ever was because he preached separation. Um, he preached hatred of father and mother and children. Um, he, he, he preached all that coming out all, the whole night, but you never hear that. So when people try to levy to say that we're like Jim Jones and stuff, what it is, it's, it's ignorance and fear because Satan a long time ago has, has had to try to, you know, raise up something, uh, people independently. It's amazing. When you walk in lockstep with this world, you're doing as the world do. Nobody says anything. As soon as you do something different, then eyes, the dynamic changes, the eyes start coming on you. And then people, the first thing they want to do is label you as a cult because they have no other word in their vocabulary. Um, you know, they, they're, they, they, they don't have the uh, mental aptitude to be able to associate it with anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, inevitably, you're going to end up inheriting through a bunch of illiterate, ignorant people names. People are going to call you all type of disparaging names and comments because they don't understand. So I'm fine with it because Yahshua, Jesus said it was going to happen anyway. It doesn't trouble me at all. I'm here, but I can't do this by myself. Mm. Sister Carol's been there mm. all the way through. Mm. Um, brothers, mm. faithful, mm. one heart, one mind, love the Father mm. um, with me through thick and thin. Mm. If I didn't have them, there wouldn't be any straight wings. 